Let's see here. We're going to get into uh, the uh, this morning. We're going to be we're going to focus on the spirit beings in the book of Daniel. Last week, if you remember, we looked at it in a dispensational context, and uh, today we're going to look at it as the spirit beings as they reveal for us. Father, in thy holy name, I pray that you give me the gift of teaching. I pray you bless the folk who've gathered together. I pray now in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I've been adjusting this volume. Is this too loud or too low? Does it sound about right? Okay. It's been hard to get everything set right because we've, everything's changed. The acoustics in the auditorium are completely different from what they used to be, and I'm trying to get it right for the folks. And uh, so just let me know if it's, if it's not loud enough or it's too loud or whatever. All right. Now turn the book of, uh, the book of uh, uh, Daniel, chapter number 4 and verse number 17. Daniel 4.17. Now we have some strange things happening in Daniel. Uh, it's not just that it happens in Daniel. It happens everywhere, but it's recorded in Daniel. And I want you to remember that Daniel is a book of the captivity. It's like Ezekiel. It's a book that is written about Israel while they are away from their land in a foreign land and uh, someone else is exercising authority over their land, occupied. It's being occupied. And uh, what's happening here in the book of Daniel is there is a spiritual warfare that takes place that cannot be seen with the human eye, but, uh, the, uh, uh, but is real nonetheless. And it shows you a little bit of an idea of what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he talks about principalities and powers. And here in Daniel chapter number 4 and verse number 17, the scripture says, This matters by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now if you notice here, uh, the word watchers shows up. Now, the book of Enoch, as I've mentioned to you before, is a, a pseudepigraphic book or an apocryphal book. And uh, a lot of people today are quoting the book of Enoch extensively and building a lot of doctrines based on the book of Enoch as it relates to the second coming and what's going to happen in the last days. Let me give you this warning right now. Anything outside the Bible is to be treated with caution, extreme caution, extreme caution. The Bible is the only inspired book on this earth. It is God's word. Anything else, if it agrees with the Bible, good for it, but it is not the source of authority. But the book of Enoch is loaded with, with, uh, with uh, information about the watchers. And who are the watchers? Well, according to the book of Enoch, the watchers are fallen angels. Say, so, well, is that who a watcher is? We don't know that for sure. We don't know that. This is what Enoch, the book of Enoch, talks about, being fallen angels. If you get into, do a little research on the internet today, you'll be amazed at how many names that you can pull up of the fallen angels. They list them in alphabetical, alphabetical category. Hundreds of names of fallen angels. I got to look at that thing the other day and I thought, now, you know, you got to be careful with something like this because anytime you get into names, you can be calling on the one that that name belongs to. And you better be very careful, careful with it. So I'm not going to give out the names. There's no point in it, and it's not going to help anything in here. But just understand that in the, in the, uh, in the, in the religious cafeteria world of today, everything and anything goes. And it is amazing at how much information's out there. And you, if you want to do that research on your own, you'd be amazed at all the names of the angels. But I warn you, I believe I'd leave it alone. These are so-called fallen angels. Now, are there fallen angels? Absolutely. When I say so-called, I mean these are the names of the fallen, the so-called names of the fallen angels. There are a few names in the Bible, Belial, Beelzebub, and so forth. This is for a different study. 
They definitely refer to spirit beings. But what we're talking about is what's in the book of Daniel. So the watcher in the book of Daniel, we have no idea exactly who they are. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to leave it when the Bible is quiet about a thing. I'm going to leave it alone. But we do have something going on in Daniel that is very unusual. Look at the Daniel chapter number 10 and verse number 13. Daniel 10, verse 13. If you start reading with verse number 12, the scripture says, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou hast set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes. Now let's stop right there for just a moment. Who is Michael? He's named in scripture. He's an archangel. He's a holy angel. There's only two angels named in scripture and both of them show up in Daniel. The only book in the Bible like that. Now Gabriel is mentioned again in Luke. But here in the book of Daniel, Gabriel and Michael both show up. That's quite remarkable. Considering all of the books of the Bible, this is the only book, only 12 chapters, that both names, both of these angels show up. Michael is an archangel. Gabriel is an angel. I assume an archangel, but the scripture doesn't call him that. But the Bible plainly says that Michael is an archangel. Now, we have an archangel being resisted by the prince of Persia. Notice that Michael is called a prince, and the prince of Persia said in contradistinction to it. So we're talking about, in the same context, spirit beings. We're not talking about a human being who is the prince of Persia. That wouldn't make any sense. We're talking about Michael who is called a prince, and we're talking about the prince of Persia. So it's obvious to me that a spirit being confronts another spirit being. That's what's going on here. Now, it means that Persia has a spirit being that represents Persia. And Michael, Daniel chapter number 12, it says plainly, stands for the people or the children of Israel. Michael represents Israel. And so the confrontation takes place here in answer to a prayer. He withstood him 21 days and wouldn't let Michael get through. Now there's a lot of controversy today as to who Michael is. Uh, a lot of churches are teaching that Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not believe that. I do not believe it. Michael is, an, he is a creature. Uh, just like every other living being is a creature. There's only one creator. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator. Anything else is inferior to him, including Michael. If you'll remember, the Bible says in the book of Jude that when Satan and Michael were contending for the body of Moses, the scripture says, Michael said, the Lord rebuked thee in reference to Satan. All right. The Lord rebuked thee. Well, if the Lord Jesus Christ is Michael, then why would the Lord Jesus Christ say the Lord rebuked thee? The Lord would say, I rebuke thee. That's what he said. Get thee. Hence, Satan, when he was in the wilderness, remember? He didn't say, the Lord send thee hence, Satan. The Lord Jesus says, get thee hence, Satan, speaking directly to him. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for rejecting the idea that Michael is the Lord Jesus. And I've got a lot of reasons why I do, but this is not about that. It's just, I just thought I'd mention that to you to, for you to understand that there's an awful lot of tradition around Michael, a lot of tradition in, in the Roman Catholic Church and other, and other churches and religion. And a lot of them teach that Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ. I do not believe that. I believe that Michael is a creature, high and exalted and elevated, yes, but he's still a creature. He is an archangel. That means that he stands above all the other angels. But even an archangel could be withstood for 21 days. Now that's something to think about. You think about the powers that, uh, that, are, that are arrayed against each other when you look into the spirit world. 
The bottom line is that all of these nations on earth, and the reason for this to be clear is that, notice carefully what it says here in Daniel chapter number 4 and verse number 17. Daniel chapter number 4 and verse 17. That the living may know, start in the middle of the paragraph, that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, now watch carefully, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Just because God's put a man over a nation, a country, or what have you, doesn't mean that man's a good man. He's simply there as God places him to be there to fulfill his will and his purpose. He put Nebuchadnezzar on his hands and his feet for seven years. and His fingernails grew out and his hair grew out till he learned that the, that the Most High ruled and that he was only a king insofar as God allowed him to be a king. And he was that head of gold. So the point is that uh, these spiritual beings represent nations. They represent, they represent earthly power and that they come against each other and that there is a battle raging that you can't see with your natural eyes. And that battle, no doubt, has probably raged for a long time here in America because for a long time America was never a perfect nation, but America was definitely a far different nation than it is today. And it, uh, it had so many Christians that preached the gospel and it was so noble and... Uh, in its, uh, in, its, uh, in its position in the world. So this, this combat, this confrontation that takes place between these spirit beings is happening right now at this very moment while we're talking. And Michael is still standing for the children of Israel as he always has and he always will. And I would, I would, do so, I would, I would give a lot of consideration to that right now while I'm talking, while I'm on the subject. Uh, I don't know what your position is toward Israel. And I don't know if you are uh, what somebody might call anti-Semitic. But I'm going to tell you something right now. I believe when God said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, I believe that is still in vogue today. And I am pro-Israel 100%. Does Israel make mistakes? Absolutely. Are they a perfect kingdom? No. Have they, have they, have they, have they comported themselves in the wrong way sometimes? Yes. But what nation hasn't? But I still support Israel 100%. And uh, Michael is standing for Israel. And so an army that shoots bullets and uh, lasers and what have you, what kind of a chance do you think they have against an archangel? One angel of the Lord. One angel. Doesn't name them. Just one angel. God dispatched and say, take care of Sennacherib's troops. That's all he did. He said, take care of them. They woke up the next day, 186,000 corpses lay scattered out on the ground. One angel. One angel. And uh, so you don't want to mess with an archangel. If God turns him loose, we're finished. <laughs> That's all I can say. So we have this confrontation between nations. All right? The spiritual battle that goes on. There's a reason for that. And there's a motive behind it. That's in God's purpose and God's God's reasoning for that. But that battle is raging. One nation rises, another one falls. It rises for a while, then it goes down. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. There's only one group of people on the face of this earth that are called the ancient people, the eternal people. You know who that is? That's the Jew. That's the Jew. You can be certain if the Lord doesn't come back for a thousand years, you may, there may be no Americans on the face of this earth, but there will be Jews. There will be. They'll be here, which I don't think is going to happen. I believe he's going to come back long before a thousand years. That's a long time for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> a thousand years with the Lord is as a day, and a day is a thousand years. I want you to notice something here in the book of, uh, in the book of Revelation chapter number 12. And verse number seven. Revelation twelve seven. And there was war in heaven. 
Michael and his angels. See the archangel? Michael and his angels, the archangel, fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. The dragon is Satan. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out of the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now he's cast down to the world. He's cast down to the earth. I want you to notice carefully in verse number 1 of Revelation 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who's the woman? If we can get the woman right, we can understand what's going on in Revelation chapter number 12. A lot of people out there, especially ah and post-millennial preachers, tell you the woman is the church. Woman's not the church. It's not the church. When you go back to the book of Genesis and to the vision that Joseph had, you'll find that Joseph's vision matches perfectly what goes on here in Revelation 12. And the vision that Joseph had was in reference to Israel. Israel. In plain words, what we have here in Daniel, in, in Revelation 12, is Israel. Israel is bringing forth a man-child. Now, you can interpret that in a lot of different ways. You can say, well, this was a prophecy of what happened 2,000 years ago, and that this man-child, Revelation 12, is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all right. Or you can say that this man-child is David when he's coming back to rule over his people to sit in Jerusalem. And when he sits in Jerusalem that uh, he's going to reign over the combined kingdoms of Israel. Some believe that. I believe that the man-child of Revelation 12 strongly points toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the man-child. And Satan was there to devour him when he was born. Remember? They tried to kill him, tried to devour him. And the reason is because he's the Messiah. In Revelation chapter number 12, though, notice carefully, this dragon, Satan, and his angels are directly connected with the children of Israel and with trying to destroy them. That's what the 12th chapter of Revelation is about. It's about Satan being cast out of heaven down to the earth and trying his best to destroy the chosen people, which is Israel. He's trying to do it. Now, he's not going to do it. He's not going to be successful. But that's what's happening in Revelation chapter number 12. You notice how when the Bible says things and then when the Bible doesn't say things, the Bible is silent about a lot of things. And the silence of the Bible sometimes speaks louder than the words. When the Bible refuses to say something about a certain thing, there's a reason for it. The New Testament that I've got in my hand right here, you've got a New Testament in your hand. That was completed about 90 to 95 A.D., that New Testament. When it was completed, the canon of Scripture was closed. That meant that all 66 books of Holy Writ were sealed. And like the seal that God told Daniel over there in Daniel chapter number 12 to seal up the book and open it up at the end time. It's sealed. And we can't add to it. And we certainly can't take from it. Jehudi did that when he took a pen knife and cut part of the Bible out and threw it into the fire. God said, Jeremiah, take another scroll. And he did, and he wrote it again. The Bible is the Word of God. It is the absolute judge of everything on this earth. I will not take the book of Enoch or, or the book of Maccabees or, or the book of Judith or Bell and the Dragon or any of the rest of this stuff and lay it down next to the Bible and judge the Bible by it. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let the Bible judge it. Now, the Jewish people, the Jewish people reject your Messiah, your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Most Gentiles don't really know why that the Jewish people reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't really know why. They think, well, now why doesn't, why don't they receive him? Why don't they, I mean, after all, he is the Savior of all mankind. Here's the problem. 
from, the, from, from as far back as they can remember, a little child grows up in Judaism. He is taught from the Talmud that the Lord Jesus Christ is everything in the world but their Messiah and their Savior, that he's demon-possessed, boiling an excrement in hell. Everything he did, he did it by demonic power, that he was, a, that he was, a, that he was an illegitimate birth, son of a Roman soldier, and that everything he, that everything, every so-called miracle he performed was nothing but deception and witchcraft. Now imagine being taught that. Imagine being taught that. And then, uh, and then someone comes to you and tries to witness to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. They appeal to their Talmud. Now, I've told you before about Alfred Edersheim. Edersheim. I'm going to read something for you this morning that I hope will help put in perspective what we're talking about, for you to understand there is a vast difference between inspired scripture and the religious world out there. The New Testament never borrows revelation from out there. Revelation comes straight from God. It's important to understand. I'm not talking about necessarily just the book of Revelation. I'm talking about revelation. In other words, something that cannot be known except God reveals it. It, they, it does not borrow its revelation from Enoch, Belnadragon, Judith, and the rest of them. Revelation comes from the prophets, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now let's get into what Edersheim says. Uh, I took this from the, uh, from the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. Alfred Edersheim was a Jew that got saved, he was fully equipped to compare the Jewish religion with Christ and his Bible. He was taught as a child the things that I'm telling you about right now, uh, you know, about what they teach in the Talmud about Christ. But his observations are wonderful. He was a scholar of the first rank. And if you ever have an opportunity to get a hold of a book, get a hold of the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. I forget how many pages it runs, but it's on up there, 800, 900, uh, huge book. But it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's, the, it's about the life of Christ, one of the finest books ever written. When it comes to that, here's what he says. In truth, rabbinism, rabbinic Judaism, you know what rabbinic Judaism is, had no system of theology only what ideas, conjectures, or fancies that the Haggadah yielded concerning God. The Haggadah means the way. Haggadah means the way. It's an interpretation. Angels, demons, man, his future destiny and present position, and Israel with its past history and coming glory. All they knew was what they received from this, from this tainted, distorted, perverted text. Accordingly, by the side of what is noble and pure, what a terrible mass of utter incongruities of conflicting statements and too often debasing superstitions, the outcome of ignorance and narrow nationalism, of legendary coloring of biblical narratives and scenes, profane, coarse, and degrading to them, the Almighty himself and his angels taking part in the conversations of rabbis, the discussions of academies, nay, forming a kind of heavenly Sanhedrin, which occasionally requires the aid of an earthly rabbi. The miraculous merges into the ridiculous and even the revolting. Miraculous cures, miraculous supplies, miraculous help, all for the glory of great rabbis, who by a look or word can kill and restore to life. At their bidding, the eyes of a rival fall out and are again inserted. Nay, such was the veneration due to rabbis that Rabbi Joshua used to kiss the stone on which Rabbi Eliezer had sat and lectured, saying, quote, This stone is like Mount Sinai, and he who sat on it like the ark. Unquote. Modern ingenuity has indeed striven to suggest deeper symbolical meaning for such stories. 
It should own the terrible contrast existing side by side. Hebrewism and Judaism, the Old Testament and traditionalism, and it should recognize its deeper cause in the absence of that element of spiritual and inner life which Christ has brought. Thus, as between the two, the old and the new, it may be fearlessly asserted that as regards their substance and spirit, there is not a difference but a total divergence of fundamental principle between rabbinism and the New Testament, so that comparison between them is not possible. Here there is absolute contrariety. What did he say? He said that there is no way that you can sit down with a rabbi and his Talmud and his traditions and the New Testament and carry on a conversation because there's no, nothing between the two books that is uh, compatible. That everything that he believes is based on utter superstition, demonic lies, false assumptions, no question about the fact that it had its origins in Babylon and in Persia, and in all the foreign countries that they were, that they were, uh, that they were around, and that the New Testament is so far different and above what's in that Talmud that the difference itself ought to make you stand back and say, "Hallelujah to God!" That New Testament did not come from Judaism. That New Testament came from the Lord God Himself. And he used Jews to write it. And the Jews that he used to write it wrote it out of revelation. In many cases, turning against their own traditions, their own, uh, their own families, their own upbringing, everything they had known up until that point, they had to deny it, turn from it, and write the New Testament as God revealed it to them. That's exactly what they did. And when the Apostle Paul got saved and began to define the cross and the doctrine of the cross and all of that, it was completely separate from everything that he had been taught up until that point. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was steeped in the, in the, in the Talmud, in the Mishnah, the Gemara, the, uh, the, uh, uh, all of the books that make up the Talmud. He was steeped in that stuff, and yet the Apostle Paul turned his back on it, walked away from it, and the revelation that he gave you in the New Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ was completely and totally separate from anything the Talmud has. Now here's a question. I believe that's true. Since that is true, you are faced with a situation where it should be, it should be clear and obvious to you that there is an absolute source of divine truth and then there is a source of lie and deception. Now, I'm not telling you that the New Testament and the Old Testament is incompatible. I'm not telling you that at all. I'm talking about the Talmud. I'm talking about the traditions of men. I'm talking about something that came from, uh, that came from Babylon and Persia and the doctrines came from Babylon and Persia, not the Old Testament. You can lay the Old Testament down next to the New Testament and they're compatible with each other. <coughs> One complements the other. Absolutely. If you remember the two on the road to Emmaus, he took them into the Old Testament and he showed them from the scriptures. He opened up Christ to them. Should not Christ come and suffer and then enter into his glory? First of all, he's the suffering Messiah then he enters into his glory. Then he comes back as the reigning Messiah. The Old Testament will back that up, but there's nothing like that in the Talmud. You see what I'm saying? So what have we got? <coughs> Where does that put us today? Think about this for a minute. We have a debt to the Jewish people. We have an enormous debt to them. We do, folks. We owe the Muslim nothing. We owe the Buddhist nothing. We owe the Hindu nothing when it comes to the source of truth. But the Jew, 
they kept the oracles of God. When a man stands up and says, I am against the Jews and I hate the Jews, you're saying it out of utter ignorance. Because the New Testament was, a, was the logical progression of the Old Testament. The New Testament was the Old Testament fulfilled. And the Jew is the natural olive tree. And they're the root in, in Romans chapter number 11. And he has blinded them and he will come back and he will save them. But even the Jews, even the Jews, which would have been the last line of defense against error, superstition, and ignorance, even they fell. Because you have a New Testament that you know did not come from the Talmud. It did not originate with that. Where did it come from? The New Testament is different from every other book on the face of this earth. I don't care what religion you go into. It make any difference. If you go into Mohammed's religion and all of his demons and his angels, <coughs> if, you go into, if you go into the Hinduism with their millions of gods, Zoroastrianism with all of that, Buddhism, which was an outgrowth of, of, uh, of uh, a Brahmism, Brahmism, Buddhism, and Hinduism was the progression through that. If you go to any of these religions, you're going to find that there's a common thread among all of them. You're going to find that there's so many things about every one of them that are interconnected, that they believe so many things at the same way. They may use different names, but they all believe the same thing, essentially, till you come to the New Testament. And it is absolutely <coughs> and completely different from every other book on the face of the earth. I'm not coughing as bad as I was last week. <clears throat> Brother, Whitby, Brother Whitby said he's been in bed for 11 days. Amen. Been sick as a dog. That's rough. The stuff's been going around. I pray for him. So there's nothing, there's nowhere else to turn but the New Testament. The next time, the next time, some arrogant smart aleck from the University of Tennessee that's been brainwashed in those classes over there with comparative religion, and they think they're educated, and they're as ignorant as they can be. They come up and tell you that all oh, Christianity is just another religion. It's just another way of man's trying to find uh, his concept of God. Uh, they're, they all originated in ignorance and came from cavemen and blah, blah, and on it goes, on it goes. They're speaking from utter ignorance. They are. They're ignorant. They're ignorant, and they don't know they're ignorant. They think they're educated. But the bottom line is, if they knew what I just gave you this morning, how that the New Testament is completely divorced and elevated light years above everything else on the face of this earth and has no connection whatsoever with it. An angel in the New Testament is not an angel in the Talmud. An angel in the New Testament is not an angel in the Koran. An angel in the New Testament is not an angel in, in the Buddhism and Hinduism and all the rest of that stuff. Totally different. Totally different. Yet they're teaching them over there that, and then they get in the public school system, and they get up in front of our kids, and they, and they wave their degree in their face as if I'm the final authority, intimidate the kids, and then begin to tear down and destroy the foundations of what we believe from the Bible. From the Bible. From the Bible. I wasn't taught this when I first got saved. It took me decades of study, and I've read a lot of stuff to come to the conclusions that I've come to that I'm giving out to you this morning. That New Testament you've got in your hands is an inspired book. And it owes absolutely nothing to paganism. And it owes nothing to anybody's religion. That New Testament is a revelation. It's different. And the fact that it is different uh, is, is, one of the, is, the proof, is one of the proof positive of its, uh, of its authenticity and its genuineness. But the fact that people read that New Testament and drug addicts are no longer drug addicts, thieves are no longer thieves, murderers are no longer murderers, people get saved and their life changes because they read that New Testament. It has the power to save your soul and change your life like no other book on the face of the earth. I would recommend that you read Edersheim, for he's outstanding. He says one thing over here, though, <clears throat> that I thought was remarkable. He, he, he does his homework. I mean, it's an exhaustive uh, work on, uh, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, spirit being. And it's section under evil spirits, Shadim, Rukim, Rukath, 
Lillian. Here also as throughout, we mark the presence of Parsi elements of superstition. Parsi means uh, of uh, Persia, Zoroastrianism. In general, these spirits resemble the gnomes, hobgoblins, elves, and spirits of our fairy tales. That, now, this is in the Talmud. They're like them. They may use different names, but the identity is the same. They are cunning and malicious, and contact with them is dangerous, but they can scarcely be described as absolutely evil. Indeed, they often prove kind and useful, and may at all times be rendered innocuous and even made serviceable. He gives a little section on their origin and nature. Opinions differ to their origin. In fact, they variously originated. According to a reference in the Talmud, they were created on the eve of the first Sabbath. But since that time, their numbers have greatly increased. For according to a reference to this Talmud, multitudes of them were the offspring of Eve and of male spirits, and Adam with female spirits, or with Lilith, the queen of the female spirits, during the 130 years that Adam had been under the ban and before Seth was born, and on and on and on and on it goes. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Interesting. Although Shadim, Shadim, that's an Aramaic word which means demon, although Shadim bear, when they appear, the form of human beings, they may assume any other form. And how many of you have heard a lot about shape-shifting lately? <laughs> it's nothing new. None of this stuff is new. None of it's new. It's just <laughs> repackaged and applied to your generation. Most people like to view the spirit world like you're watching a movie or a documentary or you've got a new toy and you want to play with it. It's like something that you think you can control. But if you're not careful, you can open up the gates of hell into your home. You better be very careful when it comes to spirits. This is one preacher, as I've said to you so many times before, you better try the spirits. You better try them. And... If you think you can resist a spirit in the flesh, you are, you are sadly mistaken. In plain words, if you think that just by, by, by determination and your will and uh, something of that nature, that you're going to stop an evil spirit from wrecking havoc in your life, you're dead wrong. Well, how do I do it, preacher? By the blood of Christ. The spirit, whether, whether the average Christian in America, quote unquote, has a clue about it, the spirit world knows about the blood of Christ. They know the power in the blood. They know the power in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know that power. And if a real believer calls upon that name and applies that blood toward a spirit being, that spirit being is no longer confronting that person. That spirit being now has to deal with the authority of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and the shed blood at the cross at Calvary. And that spirit being doesn't stand a chance if you really believe and you call out his name. My wife said the other day, she said, I heard you talking again at 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, yep, <laughs> sure did. <laughs> Another one showed up at my bed, and I let it know just like I did the last one who I belonged to. And I pled the blood of Christ. I spoke to it like I'm speaking to you. Now, you know, a lot of people put you in a straight jacket, take you to the funny farm, and, they, you know, they think, well, he's gone off the deep end. No, I believe that what I'm teaching you, I believe. And there is a spirit world out there, and you don't want to mess with them. And when they come around you, let them know who you belong to and plead the blood of Christ against them, and it just fades away. And it's gone. And it may come back again, but it's, it's gone. And you have to learn that. And, and uh, don't be afraid to do that. I wasn't taught this. The church that I was saved into, they were straight, lay, stiff-necked, <laughs> uh, good Baptist, you know, but you don't talk about spirits and, and uh, certain things. And, 
And I had to learn this on my own. And I'm telling you this morning, we're in a battle to the death. We're in a battle. All right, I'm, I'm done with this lesson. We'll pick it up again next week. We've got about three or four minutes. You might have a question. I'll try to answer it or an observation or statement or anything you'd like to say. Yes, sir. Here's the thing about the Talmud. According to them, here's what the Jews teach. God gave two laws at Sinai. He gave a written law written on tables of stone. Then he gave an oral law. The oral law given at Sinai was to be passed on from generation to generation orally. Therefore, it remained a secret within the people. Only the people would ever know. It was nothing written so no scholar could research it. That oral law that was given at Sinai is, has been refined down through the years. The Mishnah means the second giving of the law. The Gemara is the commentary on the Mishnah. And the commentary, as you just said, continues to grow. It continues to develop in time. As they face new challenges, as life changes, the contemporary situation, then the Gemara reflects that because they have to make interpretations of how to live, how do you deal with this, you know, things that we deal with 2015 they didn't have to deal with 100 years ago. And so that's, that's what's developing in that. It continues to grow. <coughs> and it was talking about this one uh, prayer that the rabbis used to do on an inanimate, inanimate object and turn that inanimate object into a creature of doom to do their bidding to destroy their enemies. And see, that's witchcraft. Exactly. That's witchcraft. Exactly. That's witchcraft. And, and the Old Testament is, you know, you can read time and again, don't be dis dismayed the signs of the seasons. Uh, what are you doing baking cakes, the queen of heaven? You're down there in North Africa and you're learning the, the ways of the heathen. And the witch of Endor conjured up a dead, uh, conjured up a demon, but God brought Samuel up and shook her to her very core. That's witchcraft. Absolutely. They're, they don't go to the Old Testament. They quote the Talmud. The Talmud is the, is the, is the great uh, white elephant. Yes, sir. Yeah. And we know who Tammuz is. It's over there in Jeremiah. That's right. Yeah. How'd that get in there? They changed the original names. And uh, put these put these pagan names in there because of the influence, Parsi influence, Babylonian influence. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Amen. Yes, sir, brother.
Good. Good. Yes, sir. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. Good. You don't brag about your sword. You don't talk about your sword. You use the sword. The Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Use it. Just preach it. It'll get the job done. All right, let's pray and we'll, we'll let you go. God bless you now. Uh, Brother McLeod, Bruce McLeod, dismiss it.